Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to compare first, second and third degree price discrimination. And I should say these strategies can be quite complex in their own right, so I have done separate videos on all of these and those videos are more detailed than what I'll do here, so I'll link to those videos below if you need to have a look. Comparing these three methods though does give a nice review of what's going on. So on the screen here I have a column for a description of each type, one column describing the outcomes and one for the challenges. And so let's start with first degree. Typically we model firms engaging in first degree when they charge the price of a good equal to its maximum willingness to pay and they do this for every unit that they trade. So I'll show you what this looks like in a second, but this will mean that one of our outcomes is the firm manages to take all of the possible surplus in the market and related to this, there will be no deadweight loss. So to demonstrate this, imagine a firm faces this demand and marginal cost curve. If we first consider, just say this unit, the Q prime unit, the highest willingness to pay for that unit is given by the height of the demand curve here. And so that will be equal to the price for that Q prime unit if the firm charges price is equal to willingness to pay. Likewise, we can think about the Q prime prime unit, so maybe here, the highest willingness to pay for that unit is up here. So that will be the price that the firm charges if they engage in first degree price discrimination by charging prices equal to willingness to pay. Since our demand curve then is tracking the highest willingness to pay for each of our units, as we increase the quantity, the price of each marginal unit traded continuously decreases and just follows the line of the demand curve like my red line here. This is such a good deal for the firm because they are getting to charge the absolute maximum that they can for each unit that the firm will produce right up as much as they can to where the marginal cost curve is equal to demand. The quantity associated with that point of intersection I'll call Q star. That's actually the maximum that we can trade in this market. The firm couldn't possibly trade anymore since for quantities after Q star, the marginal cost of production is higher than the highest willingness to pay. So there's no price that will enable a trade. It follows from this that Q star is efficient. It exhausts all of the possible trades and it doesn't overproduce where marginal cost is greater than willingness to pay. This means that the surplus in this market is at a maximum. And so there will be no deadweight loss. Because price is equal to willingness to pay for each unit that we trade, however, our consumer surplus will be equal to zero because consumer surplus is just equal to the sum of any differences between the price and the willingness to pay and price is equal to willingness to pay. In fact, in this market, all of the surplus is producer surplus, the purple area on your screen, which is price minus marginal cost summed up over all of the units traded. So when we engage in first degree, all of the surplus goes to the producer. They have priced perfectly so as to take advantage of all the willingness to pay in the market. Because of this, first degree price discrimination is sometimes described as perfect price discrimination. Now, apart from charging price equal to the willingness to pay for each unit traded, we can also perfectly price discriminate using what we call two part tariffs and also through bundling. I won't go through these methods here because it won't be important for everyone, but I have done separate videos explaining these practices and I'll link to those videos in the description below if you need to have a look. As for the challenges of first degree, first degree price discrimination is really difficult to achieve. The firm has to know the highest willingness to pay for each consumer for the product that they're selling. And this seems like a mammoth task. The firm also has to somehow make sure that the consumers with the higher willingness to pay actually pay the higher price and not the lower price that is possibly being offered to others. The firm also has to prevent what we call arbitrage, which in this context means the reselling of goods for profit. So for instance, imagine that we sell scarves and we have two customers, Mary and Stuart. If Mary's willingness to pay for a scarf is 100, then that's the price that she'll be charged. If Stuart's highest willingness to pay is 500, then that's the price that he is charged. Mary can then buy a scarf for 100 and sell it to Stuart for any price up to his willingness to pay. So let's say for 400, Mary would make $300 in profit. She only bought her scarf for 100, but was able to sell it for 400. And Stuart doesn't have to pay $500, so he's better off by 100. 
If this sort of reselling, this arbitrage is possible, the firm has failed to get Stuart to pay the higher price and the price discrimination has not worked. So first degree is hard to pull off. Despite this, we can think about some practices that we see in our day to day as at least approaching our model. For instance, in auctions, the goal is to really try to figure out and price the good that's been auctioned at the absolute maximum willingness to pay for that good. Another practice is haggling. So in a physical marketplace and even online, often prices are not advertised and instead the seller will try to haggle the price up as much as possible in the hope of gauging the highest willingness to pay associated with the consumer that's interested in the good being sold. So these sort of practices don't look exactly like our model, but perhaps we can understand these practices better through thinking about our model. So that's first degree. Now in comparison to first degree, second and third degree price discrimination are examples of what we call imperfect price discrimination, since they don't manage to perfectly grab all the surplus in the market. Let's talk about second degree first. Quite a few textbooks only talk about second degree in terms of what is called quantity discounts or block pricing. So I'll talk about these first. And both of these methods give a discounted per unit price if a consumer buys more. So as an example of a quantity discount, we might, for instance, sell packets of chips and we might give a deal, a customer can buy a single packet for $5 per packet, or if they buy three, in total they have to pay $12, which is an average price of $4 per packet. So we essentially then have two different per unit prices for our packets of chips. Let's think about what this might look like on our demand curve then if we say sold three single packets of chips for $5 and one bundle of three for 12. Well, on our demand curve, we would sell three packets at that higher price of five. The next three were sold in the bundle for $12 in total. So that's $4 each, that's a lower per unit price. So we're pricing along the curve by offering quantity discounts. Now block pricing works in a similar way. You most often see it with electricity or gas or mobile data plans. If we take a demand curve for an individual, the first say this block of quantity that they consume, so all the quantities up to Q1, the firm charges P1 per unit. For the next quantity, say this block up to Q2, it's a cheaper price per unit, a lower price P2. Again, we're pricing along the curve by offering discounts for buying more, which allows us to price the same product at different prices. Now, some textbooks stop there. That's their account of second degree, just quantity discounts and block pricing. So if that's you, you don't need to look at this next part. Just go ahead and skip to the part on third degree. The chapters are in the description. Other textbooks take the perspective that the interesting thing about these sorts of cases, these quantity discounts, is that the firm is essentially offering different options to our consumer and different sorts of consumers will choose different options. So in our example with our packets of chips, some consumers will buy only one or two packs and not get the discount, and other sorts of consumers will buy the whole bundle of three. Now under this view of second degree, it's sometimes called menu pricing, the interesting thing is the creation of the menu of options that the consumers will self-select into. More abstractly, to give a rudimentary example, if we had broadly two types of consumers, a high willingness to pay consumer and a low willingness to pay consumer, the firm will produce two versions of their product in a menu of options, one designed for the first type of consumer, and this will involve spending more money. The other option is designed for the low willingness to pay, low demand consumer, that will be cheaper. The classic example here is airline tickets. So most airlines offer economy flights tickets and business flight tickets. And really this menu of options is designed to get the higher willingness to pay consumer, that's the business people, to spend more. But the airline will still offer the economy class ticket, which will be a lower price in order to still engage our low willingness to pay consumer. Now note that the two products here are not exactly identical, though we can say crudely at some level both tickets transport their customer for a location A to B in an aeroplane. Economy tickets, of course, will be less comfortable compared to business, which will be more comfortable and filled with lots of perks such as short stopovers or the ability to skip ahead in line, which is the airline trying to entice that high willingness to pay consumer to buy the more expensive product. The differences in the price of the tickets isn't just differences in marginal cost of production, but rather really targeting to different consumer types with different sorts of demand. 
Now, the challenges of second degree price discrimination thus described will be around making sure that the firm prices and designs their menu optimally. We usually divide this problem into two parts. Firstly, we have to make sure that all of our types of consumer that we want to engage are engaged, basically making sure that our options are cheap enough for our consumers. That's often called a participation constraint. We also have to make sure, however, that our higher willingness to pay consumers really do choose the more expensive option and not the cheaper one. This is often called incentive compatibility constraints, making sure that our types of consumers that we have are consuming the menu items that are designed for them. And from this perspective, second degree price discrimination is not just about quantity discounts, but more generally about offering a menu of choices where consumers with different types of demand will self-select into different menu options, and that will work as long as the participation and incentive compatibility constraints are met. Now that discussion of menu pricing contrasts very nicely with third degree price discrimination. So third degree price discrimination is when the firm faces consumers of different types, just like second degree. So as an example, let's say again, we had a high willingness to pay type of consumer and a low willingness to pay type of consumer. In this case, though, the firm can easily identify when a consumer presents themselves, what type they are, and they can prevent what we discussed before, arbitrage, the reselling of the product between our consumer types. If the firm can do this, then the firm can just go ahead and have two different prices for our different types of consumer for exactly the same product. The classic example here is tickets to the cinema, which very often come in different types. You might have a standard adult ticket and a discounted ticket for students. These tickets will be different prices for exactly the same product as seat in the cinema. Now underlying this assumption is that the non-student adults have a higher demand compared to the students. So maybe something like what we have on the screen here. If we profit maximize over each of these demand curves, so we set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost in each submarket, you can see that adults have a higher willingness to pay compared to the students, their demand is higher. And so the optimal price for adults, PA, comes out higher than our optimal price for students, PS. Now in the cinema example, we can tell who is a student or not because students have ID cards. So the first requirement is met we can tell who belongs to which type of group when they present themselves. We can also prevent the students reselling their cheaper tickets to adults just by requiring that those holding student tickets have their ID readily available on them. So that will be the firm helping to prevent arbitrage. And these are really the challenges facing the firm when engaging in third degree price discrimination. They do need to be able to correctly identify their different types of consumers they need to be able to stop them from reselling the product to one another. And if the firm can do that, they can just very straightforwardly then charge different types of consumers, different prices for exactly the same product. So that's a third degree. And really that's it. That's how I think about comparing first, second and third degree price discrimination. As I said at the beginning, these are all quite complex. I didn't wanna make this video too long, but I'll refer you to the other videos uh, if you need a more detailed account. I really do hope this video helped though. If it did, please like and subscribe. Thank you guys so much for watching. Have a good one.